Welcome back to Calculus 2. I'm Dr. Jeff Grove. Today, we're going to talk about net change. And area between curves. First, remember that if you have some function and you integrate the derivative of that function, the integral represents the class of antiderivatives. Antiderivatives of derivatives gives you the original function, but only to within a constant of integration. If, however, we were to use a definite integral from zero to, say, some number, the fundamental theorem of calculus allows us to select any antiderivative of little f prime, an antiderivative being f of x. So we get f of t evaluated from 0 to x, which gives us f of x minus f of 0. What we have here is the net change of the function f. And you get it by a definite integral of f prime. Now, technically, we don't have to use zero here to get net change. In fact, net change is defined more generally as f of x minus f of x naught which will be the integral from x naught to x of f prime of t dt. If we have a differential equation, dy dx is some um, f prime of x, then y should be the integral of dy dx dx. Well, that's going to end up being f of x plus c there's a constant of integration, which means solutions to this kind of differential equation are curves, but there's a one parameter family of curves. You end up with curves that differ by some vertical translation, some increasing of the value of y. If you want to get a particular solution out of this, one that passes through some point, x naught, y naught, what you do is you assume that in addition to the differential equation, you have an initial condition that y of x naught equals y naught, in which case we'll get the following. Uh, y naught will be y of x naught, that's going to be your f of x naught plus c. That then tells you what the c is. C is y naught minus f of x naught. You can incorporate this piece of initial data into the integral moving this over you can get y equals that y naught plus the integral from x naught to x f prime of t dt so here we get the future values of whatever this function is. Let me give you an example. Here's an example. Let's suppose that our acceleration function is constant at minus g. Minus because acceleration is down, let's say, and g is the constant acceleration due to gravity. By the way, do you know the name of the guy who discovered that acceleration near the surface of the Earth, anyway, is 
constant and independent of the mass of the object. That was Galileo. Galileo overcame millennia of misconceptions about motions because he experimented with it. He actually measured positions of marbles as they rolled down a ramp. With the crudeness of the clocks at the time, he had to roll them down a ramp rather than watch them fall, as you might do in an experiment in a laboratory today. Nonetheless, he discovered that these marbles had a constant acceleration that was independent of their mass. There's also that mythical experiment of Galileo dropping lead balls off the Leaning Tower of Pisa with different masses and then hitting the ground at the same time, demonstrating that they have that same acceleration independent of the mass. Let's suppose that the acceleration is the derivative of velocity. This is v prime of t. Let's also suppose that v at zero is v naught. That's your initial velocity. Then, according to the formula we just derived, what we'll have is the velocity as a function of time is equal to that initial velocity plus the integral from zero to t of this acceleration. This gives you v naught minus gt. You might have seen this formula when you took physics. Alternatively, if the height as a function of time is the derivative of the velocity, and also if the height at time zero is some value y naught, then according to our formula, y will be y naught plus the integral from zero to t of our velocity, which we now know to be v naught minus g, we'll call this x dx. We always put a dummy variable into our integrals if they're definite integrals because the value of the integral will depend only upon the limits of integration. It'll depend upon t and zero. Let's see what we get. We get y naught plus our antiderivative will be v naught x minus 1 half gx squared evaluated from 0 to t. We always plug the top limit of integration in first. That gives us y naught plus v naught t minus 1 half g t squared. And when we substitute 0 for x, we get nothing. So the height function will be the initial height plus the initial velocity times time minus 1 half the constant acceleration due to gravity times t squared. You might have seen this in a course in physics as well. Let's look at an example. Let's suppose we have here the Anadarko Tower. How tall is the Anadarko Tower? Do you know? It's 439 feet high. And let's suppose that you throw a rock up, it reaches a maximum height, and then comes down and splashes into the pond below. We have a pond down here. I want to know if this is going up initially at 50 feet per second. First of all, what's the maximum height? How long does it take to hit the water? And how fast is the rock going when it hits the water? Three questions. First, we know that y is y naught plus v naught t minus one half g t squared. Do you know what g is here? We're using English units, so g is 32 feet per second squared. We'll have y equals the initial height, 439 feet, plus the initial velocity, 50 feet per second times time, minus 1 half g, that's 16 
squared. To answer the first question, maximum height, we'll take the derivative, set it equal to zero, and solve for t first. We get t is 50 over 32, and that's in seconds. The maximum height then will be the y value at that time. That's 439 plus 50 times 50 over 32 minus 16 times 50 over 32 quantity squared. How big is that? I get about 478 feet. Notice I've put a dot over the equal sign. When I do that, it has a specific meaning. It doesn't mean approximately equal to. It means that I'm rounding to some decimal place accuracy. In this case, to the nearest unit's digit. How long does it take for the rock to splash into the pond? Well, when the rock splashes into the pond, y is zero. So we set y equal to zero. and then solve for t. We'll use the quadratic formula. Do you know the quadratic formula song? Oh dear, you have to hear it. x equals minus b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. I know. How do you get that out of your ears? It's to that catchy tune, Pop Goes the Weasel. Oh well, there it is. Notice we have a negative here on the bottom. If we multiply the top through by a negative, the negative 50 becomes positive 50, and the plus or minus is still plus or minus. The minus and the other minus under the radical will cancel and go away. Notice that because we get 50 squared plus something positive, after the square root, you'll get something bigger than 50, which means when you subtract, you'll get a negative time. We're not interested in the times before we launch the rock. Rather, we're interested in the forward time when it splashes down, so we're interested in the plus. How much is that? I get about 7 seconds. So 7 seconds after I throw the rock, it will splash into the pond. Now, the third question, how fast is the rock going when it hits the pond? Remember, the velocity is v naught minus gt. In this case, that's 50 minus 32 times t, where t is 7 seconds. We get 50 minus 32 times 7. What is that? That's minus 174 feet per second, or minus 119 miles per hour. You definitely don't want to be on a boat underneath that rock. By the way, Acceleration can be variable, and the time rate of change of acceleration is called the jerk. When you're tossed around, moving around someplace, it's not the acceleration that's tossing you to and fro, it's the jerk. Acceleration, if it were constant, would just throw you into one direction and you would stay there. It's the jerk that's primarily responsible for the wear and tear on engine parts, for instance. Suppose that I have a velocity, 3t squared minus 12t plus 9, and I want to know a, the net displacement, or t going from 0 to 4, and I also want to know the total distance traveled. 
To solve A, the net displacement is the position at time 4 minus the position at time 0, the difference between the positions at the endpoints of the time interval. This should be the integral from 0 to 4 of the velocity function. What do we get? Let's find out. We have the integral from 0 to 4 of 3t squared minus 12t plus 9 dt. This gives us t cubed minus 6t um, squared plus 9t evaluated from 0 to 4. 4 cubed is 64. 4 squared is 16. When I multiply 16 times 6, I get 60 plus 36, which is 96. And then I get another 36. We have 100 minus 96, which is equal to 4 whatever the units are in this case, let's say 4 meters. I'd like to point out that this object moved a lot more than 4 meters. That's just the net displacement. If we want to know the total distance traveled, we have to take another strategy. If the velocity is sometimes positive sometimes negative, it could be going, going, but then stopping, turning around, coming back, coming back and then stopping and then turning around and going again. In order to figure out the total distance, since it's going and then coming back and then going again, we need to not integrate the velocity, we need to integrate the absolute value of the velocity. So the total distance is the integral from some initial time to, suit, to some final time of the absolute value of the velocity function. That's a different story. In this case, our function was 3t squared minus 12t plus 9, which we can factor as 3 times t squared minus 4t plus 3, or 3 times t minus 1, t minus 3. Between 1 and 3, the function is negative. So if I want to integrate the absolute value of this, I'll have to break this up into an integral from 0 to 1 of 3t squared minus 12t plus 9. And then how do I get the absolute value? The absolute value of something that's negative is it's negative. So I'm adding the integral from 1 to 3 of the negative of 3t squared minus 12t plus 9. And then we add the integral from 3 to 4 of 3t squared minus 12t plus 9. The antiderivatives are all the same except a negative on the middle part. So we'll get t cubed minus 6t squared plus 9t evaluated from 0 to 1, minus the same thing, t cubed minus 6t squared plus 9t evaluated from 1 to 3, and then plus t cubed minus 6t squared plus 9t evaluated from 3 to 4. First you get 1 plus 9 is 10 minus 6 is 4, and then minus what you get when you plug in the 3, 3 cubed is what? 27 minus 9 times 6, that's 54, plus yet another 27. And then minus what you get when you plug in 1, which we already know is 4, plus what you get when you plug in 4. That's 64 minus, um, minus 96 plus 36, which we already calculated as 4, minus what you get when you plug in the 3. When you plug in that 3, 
you get zero. So what is the total distance traveled? Notice we have four minus negative four is eight, and then plus four, it's 12. Very different from the four meters, which was the net displacement. According to Hooke's law, the force on a spring is proportional to the displacement. This implies that the object that moves under the force of the influence of the spring alone, as if the spring is acting in outer space, is sinusoidal. In particular, in our next example, we're going to consider a spring. Springs operate under Hooke's law. Hooke's law says that the force on a spring is proportional to the displacement. That leads quickly to a sinusoidal sort of motion. Let's suppose that the velocity as a function of time is equal to, let's say, negative 3 sine of t, and the initial displacement is going to be 3. What is the displacement as a function of time? To get that, we'll use our formula it's equal to the initial displacement plus the integral from 0 to t of our velocity function, which is negative 3. We'll evaluate it at x dx here. So we get 3. When I integrate the sine, I get negative cosine. Negative, negative will give me plus 3. Cosine of x evaluated from 0 to t. This gives me 3 plus 3 cosine of t minus 3 cosine of 0. What is the cosine of 0? Cosine of 0 is 1. So I'll get minus 3. You can see then we get 3 cosine of t. What does the displacement function look like? Well, we have a maximum displacement at t equals zero. Then it drops down and then back up and it repeats over and over again, bottoming out at minus three, completing a cycle in two pi units of time. It crosses the midline first at t equals pi over two, and it bottoms out at a height of negative three at t equals pi. Let's suppose we look at the natural growth hypothesis for populations. The natural growth hypothesis is that the rate of population growth is proportional to the population size, where the constant of proportionality depends on the nature of your particular population. You can see then that 1 over PDP is equal to KDT, and if we integrate on the left-hand side, we get the log of the absolute value of P equals kt plus a constant of integration. If you exponentiate both sides, you get the absolute value of p is, keep in mind, if I have a to the b plus c, that's a to the b times a to the c. So what we'll have here is e to the kt times e to the c. The solution to an absolute value equation is x equals plus or minus a. So we'll have p equals plus or minus e to the c times e to the kt. e to the c, since c is an arbitrary constant, e to the c will be an arbitrary positive constant, but it's plus or minus. We may as well write p equals some constant, which I'll call c tilde, e to the kt. In actual practice, we'll not write this as c tilde. We'll just write it as c, kind of playing fast and loose with these arbitrary constants. After all, they are arbitrary constants. If I were to multiply it by 2, 2 times an arbitrary constant is still an arbitrary constant, so it doesn't affect anything. You may as well just call it c again. So populations that grow under the natural growth law will grow exponentially, like this. This is sometimes called the Malthusian growth law. 
after Malthus, who about 1776 said, we're all going to die. Why? He thought that it would be impossible to have enough arable land to produce enough food for one billion people. The population of the earth at the time was nearly one billion people. Well, we're not all dead, and we're way more than a billion people on this earth. So there's something wrong with Malthus's analysis. Maybe the natural growth law is not appropriate under all circumstances. Maybe it's possible to grow more food from an acre of land than you could back in 1776. Technology might have something to do with it. So many different issues. Malthus was wrong. We didn't all die. If we assume Malthus's growth law for a moment, and also that the population at time zero is some value, P naught. When I say naught, what am I referring to? Not like it's all for naught. P nothing. P naught. What I have here is a function that has a one parameter free. This is a one parameter family of curves, all growing exponentially like this. But assuming that at time t equals zero, it passes through some value p naught, picks out one of those curves. Which one? Well, at time zero, you're going to have even zero, and even zero is one. That tells you the constant of integration here is the initial population. So p is p naught e to the kt. This is the outcome of the natural growth law. Of course, there are many assumptions that we can make about populations. Let's suppose that we assume that the rate of growth of a population is equal to, let's say, 100 e to the negative 0.01 t. Let's also suppose that the initial population size is 1,000. I want to find the population size as a function of time. Remember, p of t should be p of 0 plus the integral from 0 to t of the derivative of the population size. So we're going to get p of t equals 1,000 plus the integral from 0 to t of the derivative evaluated at x. When we divide, uh, remember that the integral of e to the at is 1 over a e to the at plus a constant integration. So what we're going to have here is 100 divided by a negative 0 0.01 e to the negative 0 0.01x evaluated from 0 to t. The evaluation only takes place on this last part. In economics, there is profit, revenue, and cost. Profit is revenue minus cost, and each of these end up being functions of how many products you push out the door. A generic name for products is widget. Rather than studying the sale of a single type of product, we study the sale of widgets. There's a concept called marginal profit, marginal revenue, and marginal cost. Marginal profit is the rate of change of profit with respect to the number of widgets sold, if x is the number of widgets. Also, there's marginal revenue and the marginal cost. Let's suppose that the marginal cost is, let's say, 12 minus 0.01x squared. And x lies between 0 and 10, just for sake of argument. 
Let's find the cost function if the initial cost, the cost of startup basically, is let's say 10,000. Our cost function will be that initial cost plus the integral from 0 to x of the cost function, which I'll evaluate at t dt. We're integrating from 0 to x, 12 minus 0 0.01 t squared dt. We have then 10,000 plus 12t minus 0 0.01 divided by 3 t cubed evaluated from 0 to x. Plugging in x, that's 10,000 plus 12x minus 0 0.01 over 3x cubed, and then of course minus 0. This gives us our cost function as a function of the number of widgets sold. In interpreting marginal profit, revenue, and cost, consider the units. Profit is measured in, let's say, dollars, units of money. X is the number of widgets, so this will be the number of dollars per widget as a function of the number of widgets. In other words, it gives you the cost per widget at a certain production level. Similarly, the marginal revenue is the revenue per widget in whatever units of money you happen to be working in. at a particular level of production, and there's a cost per widget at some production level. I want to turn to an analysis of the area between two curves. To this point, we've been looking at the area of an undergraph of some function. Now, let's look at what happens if we have two functions, and we want to find the area between these two functions. Here's the idea. We'll take a thin slice. The, the height of the resulting rectangle will be the height of f minus the height of g. The width is dx. The area is then the sum, the integral, from A to B, of the difference in the heights times the width, dx. Here's an example. Find the area between f of x equals 1 over x squared plus 1, and g of x equals 1 half x on the interval from 0 to 1. You can see that between 0 and 1, this curve goes from y equals 0 to y equals 1 half. This curve at 0 is at a height of 1, and when x is equal to 1, it too is at a height of 1 half. So we have this curve coming down and another curve coming up, and they intersect at x equals 1. I want to know the area between them as x goes from 0 to 1. The top curve is always the curve 1 over x squared plus 1 until they intersect. So the area will be the integral from 0 to 1, top curve minus bottom curve. It's always top minus the bottom. If you get a negative area, you've done something wrong. Let's apply the fundamental theorem of calculus in evaluating this integral. We need an antiderivative. What is an antiderivative of this first term, 1 over x squared plus 1? 
you should recognize this as the one. And for the second term, we have x squared over 4. Plugging in 1, you need to know the inverse tangent of 1. What do you get? I want you to know this. Each time you don't get one of these trig or inverse trig function evaluations, it's minus one point on the exams. So inverse tangent of 1 is pi over 4. And then when we plug in 0, inverse tangent of 0 is 0. So our answer is 1 fourth pi minus 1. 1 half x plus 1 and a lower curve g of x equals the absolute value of x. The absolute value of x looks like a v with a reference angle of 45 degrees on each side. And here we have an intercept of 1 and a slope of 1 half. First of all, where do these curves intersect? On the right, the absolute value looks like x. So I need to solve x equals 1 half x plus 1. We'll move the 1 half over. That gives us 1 half x equals 1, or x equals 2. Where do we intersect on the left? On the left, the absolute value looks like negative x. The point of the absolute value is to make things positive. If you're plugging in a negative x value, multiplying by a negative gives you a positive. We want that to equal. 1 half x plus 1. Moving some terms around, you can see that we will get negative 1 equals 3 halves x, or x equals negative 2 thirds. Now, we need to set up integrals so that we can calculate the area between these two curves. We can set this up like the integral from negative 2 thirds to 1 of the top curve minus the bottom curve, but that's not particularly useful since the absolute value does different things to the left of zero versus the right of zero. It's better if we go from negative two-thirds to zero, one-half x plus one, that's the top curve, minus the bottom curve. And on that interval between negative two-thirds and zero, the absolute value looks like negative x. To that, we'll add the integral from zero to two top curve, 1 half x plus 1, minus the bottom curve. And to the right of 0, absolute value of x just produces x. Simplifying before we integrate, we'll have 3 halves x plus 1. And then between 0 and 2, we'll have 1 minus 1 half x. So this gives us 3x squared over 4 plus x, evaluated from negative 2 thirds to 0, plus x minus x squared over 4, evaluated from 0 to 2. Plugging in 0, we have, of course, 0. We'll subtract what we get when we plug in negative 2 thirds. We'll have 3 fourths times negative 2 thirds squared plus negative two-thirds, and then plus two, two squared is four over four is one, minus what you get when you plug in zero. We have then a, um, we have then, let's see, negative two squared is four over four, cancels, three over nine, we're going to have minus one-third minus two-thirds and then plus one. This gives us a negative one-third times a negative one is positive one-third plus one. We're getting four-thirds. Now we could calculate this in another way. These can be split into two triangles and we can calculate the area of the triangles by one-half base times height. On both of these triangles, we can consider the base to be 1. 
The height on the left will be two thirds. The height on the right will be two. You can see then we get one third plus one, which is four thirds. If we have curves that cross each other, let's suppose here's f of x and here's g of x between a and b, and we want to calculate the area. Yes, we'll integrate from a to b, and it will be a difference between the curves, but it needs to be the absolute value of the difference. That will give you the positive area that is trapped between these two curves. As an example, suppose I look at the sine curve and the cosine curve between zero and pi. They cross at pi over four. So to find the area between these curves from zero to pi, we first set up an integral from zero to pi over 4. We'll take the top curve minus the bottom curve on these sections. That means we take cosine minus sine. To that we add the integral from pi over 4 to pi, where the top curve now is sine. Finding the antiderivatives Antiderivative of cosine is sine. Antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. Antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. And of cosine is sine. Minus one point for each of these function evaluations that you get wrong. The sine of pi over 4 is the square root of 2 over 2. The cosine of pi over 4 is also the square root of 2 over 2. The sine of 0 is 0, and the cosine of 0 is 1. The cosine of pi is negative 1. Negative negative 1 is 1. The sine of pi is 0. Cosine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. And the sine of pi over 4 is also root 2 over 2. The negatives here will cancel. We'll double up on this. Half of them plus half of them is one of them. For those of you still struggling with the values of the trig functions, I want to give you something that will help you. Let's write out the sine of the various basic angles. 0, pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3, and pi over 2. Here's the trick. You can count from 0 to 4. Take the square root over 2, square root over 2, square root over 2, square root over 2, square root over 2. And these are all the correct values. How do you get the values for cosine? They're exactly backwards, cosine of 0 to cosine of pi over 2. Values for tangent, you can get that by ratios, or even better yet, memorize a table for tangent independently. It's pretty easy to see for tangent. Tangent of 0 is 0. We get 1 over the square root of 3, otherwise known as root 3 over 3, for tangent of pi over 6. Tangent of pi over 4 is 1, and tangent of pi over 3 is the square root of 3. And then we get undefined for the tangent of pi over 2.